When we think of mitochondria, think of detoxification, think of metabolism, think of oxidative stress and inflammation. These are all of the things that age us. And that's why so many people are keen on taking melatonin is a biohacking or a longevity strategy because it's actually helping to regulate those processes at the center stage of the cell where a lot of that is happening within the mitochondria. Melatonin is seen as a mitochondrial regulator in the way of a few different things. One is autophagy or mitophagy. So in other words, cleanup of the mitochondria. So one of the reasons behind aging and Deepak Chopra and so many other people talk about this, right? It's like the science of autophagy that we don't have good cleanup of cellular debris. And it seems that what melatonin is able to do is to help in that metabolic process of clearance. So again, back to detoxification, because one of the things that really jams up the mitochondria is toxicants. Just toxins in general, whether it's heavy metals, plastics, uh, xenoestrogens. And so as a result of that infiltration of those different toxicants, we get this dysfunction of the mitochondria. Those are mitochondrial poisons. And what we see now, this is, I would say, emerging work on melatonin, that we see it may also play a role in detoxification of a number of those different contaminants. So there's that. Now, the other function as it relates to the mitochondria that you already spoke to, actually, is its role as an antioxidant. But it's not just any old antioxidant. You know, that's such a 1990s word. And, you know, I think we what we started to do in nutrition science is we just started to bucket all of these nutrients and just say, oh, they're just antioxidants. Well, melatonin is a little bit different. Uh, first of all, it's amphiphilic. So what does that mean? It means that it can traverse through the fat soluble tissues and the water soluble medium of the body. So it can go in the blood, it can be in the brain. And some of the other antioxidants can't do that. So in other words, it's very flexible. In fact, there was a study, I think it was by Dr. Tan, in which he, it, it was a beautiful article because he actually showed how one molecule of melatonin gets metabolized into a number of different metabolites and they all have antioxidant capacity. So one molecule of melatonin can scavenge up to 10 free radicals. And just for comparison's sake, you know, like vitamin C, I remember reading can scavenge up to like one to two free radicals. So, you know, just if we think of melatonin doing, you know, so many more times that, so it's not to say that it's all about melatonin, because I think melatonin can work well with other antioxidants, but it does seem to exhibit some superiority in terms of its free radical scavenging. And we're going to talk about this again when we talk about synthetic melatonin and plant melatonin, because it seems that plant melatonin can scavenge free radicals even better than the synthetic type of melatonin that's out there. So I started to go down the rabbit hole of looking into how melatonin was changing the immune system. And then that led me down into looking at how melatonin, I would say, is actually a circadian nutrient. And that was the position that we took in the paper that was published in the Nutrients Journal in September of 2022. We looked at melatonin vis-a-vis -vis vitamin D and how they're kind of like two sides of the same coin. So I further got into melatonin because I was exploring it. And then I came onto a company by the name of Symphony Natural Health. And I started working with them, doing some consulting work and looking into their plant melatonin. So it did lead me into greater depth as it relates to melatonin. And I continue to watch the science and listen to people's responses, anecdotal. I'm learning actually something about melatonin. I feel like almost every day because people let me know like, oh my gosh, I tried it and this is what happened. It's like, wow, I don't see that in the literature. But if we understand the mechanisms and if we think like a scientist, we can understand how melatonin can truly have an impact. Melatonin is not new. In fact, uh, you're familiar with Dr. Ryder's work. He had published a book on melatonin back in the 1990s. 
and Dr. Andrew Weil had written, um, you know, an endorsement for the book. I mean, people have known about melatonin. It's not new to the scene. It's actually ancient. And I would say that it evolved during, um, you know, if we look at single-celled organisms and the development of things like the mitochondria. So when you think of melatonin, think of the mitochondria. So as the species started to evolve and become much more complex in metabolism, we started to see more of that melatonin concentration within cells. And even within the plant kingdom, it's kind of interesting, this just as a little tidbit, melatonin fuels the synthesis of many different phytochemicals like glucosinolates. So it's in plants, it's in animals, and it's in people, it's everywhere. So when we look at melatonin as the name, so mela refers to the skin. So it was actually discovered by a dermatologist back in 1958. And the mela refers to the melanin in the skin because he thought it was a skin lightening agent. The tonin refers to its chemical structure, which is very similar to serotonin. In fact, the way that we get melatonin in our bodies is to convert tryptophan, which is an amino acid, to serotonin, to melatonin. Now, there are a lot of enzymes and a lot of nutrients required for that conversion, and it's not always efficient. And sometimes our body needs tryptophan for other things, so we don't always get the full amount of melatonin. So your other part of the question was, where is it found? Um, if we think of the human body, when most people think of melatonin these days, they think of it for sleep. And I would say that sleep is just one little fraction of melatonin. The type of melatonin, so first of all, the, the type of melatonin in our bodies is chemically the same, but it is produced in different tissues for different functions, I would say. So the, the type that people think of as it relates to sleep is the, the pineal gland created melatonin. So that only happens at night. That happens in response to darkness. So we get a peak. It's almost like we flatline in our pineal gland melatonin throughout the whole day. Then we go to bed. And then between 2 and 4 a.m., we spike in that melatonin produced by the pineal gland. And when it's produced by the pineal gland, what happens is it it circulates systemically and it keys into receptors throughout the body on different cells and gets the cells synchronized. So the clock genes, the, the circadian rhythm. So that more than anything else is what melatonin from the pineal gland is about. It's about keeping you in line with day night rhythm. Now, by way of thinking about that though, and we're learning a lot more about its brain effects when we see that spike between 2 and 4 a.m., we also see a spike in things like glutathione, superoxide dismutase, different other types of antioxidant defense enzymes. And that's kind of interesting because if you think of sleep, one of its functions is restoration. And part of the way that we do that, we have that resetting of the immune system. We have the resetting of the brain through the lymphatic fluid. There's a lot of antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activity that's actually happening at night. And what we're starting to see is kind of like the next level of melatonin from the pineal gland is its connection to those functions. The second organ that produces a lot of melatonin, but not in response to darkness is the gut. In fact, the gut produces something on the order of 100 to 400 times the melatonin that's produced by the pineal gland. So we think that it, there are different functions of melatonin depending on where it's produced and how it's signaled. And what we know and think about the gut-derived melatonin is that it's more of a local effect. So it has more of an autocrine or a paracrine effect whereas the pineal gland melatonin is more of an endocrine, a systemic effect. So, but you know, it's produced throughout the body. You know, there, there's pretty much no organ system. It would be hard to think of an organ system that wouldn't have melatonin. But typically I think of the brain, the eyes, the eyes are a big, we're gonna talk about the eyes today. Um, obviously the skin, that's where it was first, you know, if we look at the identification of 
um, you know, hormones and skin, the skin is a huge landscape of hormones, especially melatonin. And so is vitamin D, you know, vitamin D is connected on in the liver, the kidney, the thyroid, thymus, the skeletal muscle, you know, even the ovaries, the reproductive system, and all of the fluids of the body from saliva to urine, the cerebral spinal fluid, also, um, you know, just thinking about breast milk. And so infants, when they are nourished, First, and they are they receive breast milk, they're actually getting melatonin from the mother, which helps to prime potentially what we see from animal studies. It helps to prime the gut microbiome very early in life. 